So thank you all for coming to today's lunchtime talk in science and mathematics. Before I get started with my presentation, I would like to remind you we have two other presentations coming up this semester. Uh, one will be in two weeks from today, I think, on the 17th. Dr. Nick Sines from the History Department will be talking about Spanish America and the influences they had on the scientific method. Then in early December, on December 8th, Dr. Rob Benson, Mr. Scott Travis, and Mr. Kevin Daniel will be talking about uh, implementation of GIS in a campus setting, that campus being here. So with that, um, for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Matt Neering. I'm a professor of physics here at Adams State University. And we are, um, I'm giving a presentation today on exoplanets. It's primarily just an introduction, so in part because this is not my area of expertise, but it's an area um, of interest for, uh, at some level for the past year or so. And as with anything, you can dive as deep as you would like down, to this, down in this rabbit hole. Uh, I tried to stay fairly near the surface. So with that, probably the best place to start is with a definition of an exoplanet. And you can read that there. So a planet that orbits a star other than the sun um, seems as clear as day, probably. There are a couple of problems with that, one being that the word planet is not exactly well, well defined for us. So you may recall back in 2006, I think, the International Astronomical Union decided to downgrade the status of Pluto to a dwarf planet. Um, so we have that ambiguity down on the lower end. We also have a bit of a problem on the upper end. The, if we want to talk about planets as they pertain to um, something different than other well-defined objects, uh, we're going to restrict our discussion to s sizes of objects that have a mass of roughly less than, less than 13 times the mass of Jupiter. That's not an arbitrary threshold. In part, the 13 times the mass of Jupiter is a large enough object to begin having nuclear fusion at its core. And so we like to distinguish between objects that are, do not have fusion going on and objects that do have fusion going on. But I will also say, as you research this more, there's also a lot of disagreement as to what to call those objects. So you have brown dwarfs that are above that mass. You have some brown dwarfs below that mass. Um, for the purposes of, of this talk, now that I've given that big disclaimer, just think about whatever you would think of as a planet, OK? And have that <laughs> orbiting some other star, and we'll call that a planet, OK? Fair enough? So. Um, as of last week, there are well over 3,000 exoplanets that have been discovered uh, in the last 15 to 20 years. And as, as is the case, anytime you end up with that many things, you probably need to come up with some sort of standard naming convention. And so the International Astronomical Union, same group that downgraded Pluto, uh, is the group that is organizing this effort. I will say that they are very good about trying to have community involvement in this. And there are different ways to name things. So, for my purposes here today, we're primarily going to restrict our discussion to two parts of a name. One is a proper noun, and perhaps there's some letters or numbers thrown in there. And then the other part is a lowercase letter. So the first part, the proper noun, I've listed several different uh, exoplanets here. So we have 51 Pegasi B, GJ1214B, Fomalhaut B, HR8799B, Kepler62. Those are all the, the proper noun pieces on the front end of that. So 51 Pegasi is the name of a star that comes from a particular star catalog that dates back to probably the early 1700s. Um, GJ1214 is another star in a different star catalog. And so as you go through these sequences here, you might be able to pick out which ones are associated with a star catalog. HR8799 is as well. But you also have some other uh, cases where we have this one, which is Fomalhaut B. Fomalhaut is just a common name for a particular star. Kepler-62 is not the name of a star. It's the name of a, uh, a space observatory or a space telescope. So the, the, the proper noun can be varied. And um, in fact, the International Astronomical Union participated or helped organize a contest to name things, again, in 2014 and 15. So Fomal, or sorry, 51 Pegasi B is now also named Dimidium. And the star has also been renamed. Instead of 51 Pegasi, it is also Helvetios, or however you would pronounce that. The same is true for Fomalhaut B. They did about, uh, I don't know, 35 or 40 of these objects, something of that nature. I wouldn't say it provides a lot more clarity than what we've had before, um, but it is a way to name things. And with that, I'm going to pause right there. We have pizza. Everyone dash down for pizza for five minutes, and we will come right back.
mentioning to Dr. Stalas right before the talk that, so this is uh, I think our 13th year of doing lunchtime talks, and this is the latest that the pizza has ever been, and I order other pizzas, so it's really fitting that when I order the pizza, it's on my day that it's really late. Okay, so um, I have about a two minute video uh, clip here. This, uh, there's an individual that puts out a YouTube channel called Minute Physics. Lots of good topics in there. Um, I figured if I would show you this, then those of you that need to leave, I know one person needs to leave here uh, fairly early, you will have seen everything you need to see about this talk. And so if everyone wants to clear out and I talk to an empty room, that's okay with me. <laughs> Oops. so far away and so bright compared to their planets that it's really hard to just look at one and see a planet orbiting it. Direct discovery of new exoplanets by just looking is essentially limited to relatively nearby stars with very large planets and very far away from them. Think ten times the size of Jupiter and with orbits at least as big. The vast majority of exoplanets have been found indirectly by observing their effects on their parent stars. For example, a planet passing in front of a star will make that star darker for a little while and the amount it darkens will tell you about the size of the planet relative to the star. Of course, this trick only works if the planet's orbit is tilted perfectly to pass between us and its star. And on average, less than 1% of Earth-like planets will have this convenient orbital orientation. We have managed to find a lot of exoplanets this way by exhaustive satellite searches, but we could instead look at the effect planets have on the motion of stars. As we know, planets don't orbit stars. Rather, both orbit around their combined center of mass. Stars are so heavy, the center of mass is often inside the star, but the star will nonetheless be moving. That motion manifests itself as a teeny tiny wobble in the velocity of a star relative to us, which we determine by carefully measuring the red or blue Doppler shift of the star's light. Both these indirect methods are most effective at finding big planets close to their stars, because the speeds involved and the amount of light blocked are greater, and also because close planets orbit more often, so we don't have to wait as long to notice their effects. There are other more complicated and fancy methods that can find planets which are harder to notice via star wobbling or starlight blocking, and all of these together have combined to help us discover more than 1,800 exoplanets as of 2014. Sorry, Pluto, you've been X'd out. So I would encourage you to go explore with uh, Minute Physics. It's a good YouTube station. So as far as exoplanets go, I'm not going to go in historical order. I'm probably going to go in the order that makes the most sense. So we as humans have this tendency to really um, like to believe in what we can see, right? So seeing is believing, an old cliche there. And in 2008, a group of astronomers, eight or nine folks, published a paper where they did direct imaging of a star about 50 light years away and found an exoplanet about it. So it wasn't the first one that was discovered, but this for a lot of people really felt like, okay, finally we can see something. And not only did they do a direct image, but this was also in the optical wavelengths. So if you, were, if you had the ability to look up and look at something that far away and that dim without a telescope, that's what you would see. But in the Hubble Space Telescope, which is what's on the left there, uh, that's the image that you see, and this is the image what, that was published in their paper. So this particular star, uh, as we talked about, they had naming convention. So the star is Fomalhaut, and the planet that was discovered is B. And I need to set the scale of a couple things here. So this image that you see right here, uh, the planet is orbiting out about right here, and the star is right in the center. So the semi-major axis listed in the first bullet there, you could think of that as the radius of the planetary orbit. So planets don't really go in a circle, but some of them are more circular than others. And that semi-major axis is essentially the equivalent of the radius of the orbit. So AU is astronomical units, and an astronomical unit is just defined based upon the average distance between Earth and the Sun. So if you compare this, that, or that planet is orbiting 115 times further away from its star than we are away from our sun. Its estimated orbital period is 900 years, and part of the reason that you have to estimate those types of things, obviously we don't get to watch it go through one complete period. They did measurements about 21 months apart in 2004 and in 2006, and in this blow up region right here, which you see, you see the planet moving from one spot to another. The astronomers were fairly lucky. This is a star that's been fairly well studied since, the, since probably the early 1940s. 
um, has a lot of interesting characteristics, one of which is this nice bright region of gas and dust out here. And there's actually a ring out there. And the thought was, well, maybe there was something big up out there that is sweeping up some of that gas and dust. So accumulating all of that and clearing out that region of the solar system. So it gave them a pretty good region to look at. They had some estimates of what the mass would have to be for an object that looks like that based upon if it's much larger, it would really clear out the gas and dust. If it was much smaller, it wouldn't sweep up much of it. But it's also a fairly young star system. At 100 to 300 million years old is the estimated age. Compare that to the age of our solar system and the Earth, four and a half to five billion years old. Okay? So we're talking uh, at least a factor of 10 older for our solar system. So this is a pretty young system. If you compare this, the scale of this to Jupiter, okay, which is pretty far out in our solar system by our standards here on Earth, Jupiter has a semi-major axis of about 5 AU, so that would be right in here, 1 20th the distance, essentially, uh, from here to here. Orbital period of 11.7 years, or if you wanted to consider Pluto, uh, Pluto orbits at about 40 astronomical units. That would correspond reasonably well to where that ring is placed in that diagram. So this system is much broader in extent than our own solar system. This is a much less uh, visually appealing direct imaging result. This is in the infrared portion of the spectrum. And this, there are three planets, actually. So these are some images taken or that were presented in their paper. There are three planets, two of which I have labeled there. This is 2004 in July, and this is October 17, 2007. So the planets are positioned there. The diagram that's back down here is perhaps a little easier to understand, or at least if you um, read the captions and so forth. The star is in the center right there. You would have planet B here, planet C, and planet D down here. The gray region that they have uh, identified in the schematic corresponds to a region of gas and dust. It actually has an interesting orbit as compared to uh, planet B over here, which I won't really go into. But if you'd like to know about that, I'd be happy to tell you later. Um, these range of measurements go from 2004 up onto about 2008. So the sun is in the center, and there's several rings here. They've superimposed the rings of our gas giants. So our gas giants being Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are these four innermost rings. Uh, that's where the orbits of those planets would be if you superimpose them here. So again, we have a system that is spread out much further, further than our solar system is. And also, there are three really huge planets, right? Jupiter is the largest planet in our solar system. You have three planets in one system that are 10 times larger and spread out at much larger distances. Um, and I forgot to click that. So um, spread out at much larger distances. With respect to planetary formation, though, this star is about five times as bright as our, our sun is. And as a result, that really affects the temperature range of all the gas and dust which plays a role in the formation of these planets. So it was generally thought that the large planets, uh, these gas giants, needed a much cooler temperature. Well, it turns out that these three planets would correspond to roughly the temperature range of where our Jupiter, Saturn, and, uh, Ur and Neptune, or sorry, Jupiter, Saturn, and Uranus formed in our solar system. So if you take the idea of direct imaging, um, as was said in that very short clip there, it works best for really large planets, so you can see them. It works best if they're really far away from their star. And they also, it's best if they have a face-on view, so you get to see the full extent of that solar system as opposed to the edge-on view. In some ways, this is complementary to the, most of the other techniques that have been finding the vast majority of our planet. So it's nice to have this separate confirmation of other systems out in the, out in the solar or out in the universe. OK, so the second method I wanted to mention, again, mentioned in that video, this is the radial velocity method, and this has to do with the fact that a star, and a, um, a star and a planet orbit the center of mass of one another. They tug on one another, and that wobble is what ends up creating a sort of um, detectable signal. So as this, this ring out here you see of red, that corresponds to about one solar radius. So Jupiter in our solar system would cause our sun to move about one solar radius but it's over 12 years, right? And that's going to be pretty hard to detect because you would have to measure this thing for 12 years, and some of us don't have that kind of time. To give you some idea of what this would look like on an earthly scale, let's imagine that you took a nickel and let that represent the sun, and you move it around one, radi one radius of that, so it moves back and forth uh, about one radius. 
and you want to look at this thing or you want to measure it, how far would you have to be if your sun was to be 10 light years away from where we are on Earth? And 10 light years is a pretty close distance for us to be detecting exoplanets. Most of them have been much further away. So if you think about that for a moment, you would have to put your telescope here about 1,000 kilometers away. Right? So if you were trying to detect that same level of signal, of movement, you would have to put your telescope or your nickel, one or the other, uh, one of them would be in Chihuahua, Mexico, and one of them would be here in Alamosa. So it's a pretty far distance. Now the thing is, we don't actually watch the wobble of the star. We don't get to see it physically move from one place to another. What we detect is what's called blue shift and red shifted light. So as the star moves toward us this way, it's a, it's a Doppler effect thing. You've all experienced this with trains or with race cars. So if you are a NASCAR fan and you have this car coming toward you, the sound of the car is much higher pitch than when it's going away from you. And the same thing happens in light. So you have very precise spectrometers that can distinguish the wavelengths of those lights, uh, or of the light that's coming from the star. So we have blue shift for light that's moving toward us, red shift that's away. And today's best instruments can detect mov movement of a star down to about one meter per second. So think about that for a moment. I mean, you have this gigantic object, this star. It's moving at one meter per second. That's about the pace that I walk, right? So if I'm walking at one meter per second, you can detect that object, this huge, moving at that speed. If we were to set the scale with our solar system, Jupiter causes the sun to move at a rate of about 10 meters per second. So that's actually a pretty good uh, detectable s signal there. Um, the Earth causes the sun to move at about 10 centimeters per second. So 10 centimeters per second, 10 centimeters about that far. So we're causing the Earth to, or the sun to move at about that, at that speed back and forth, but it's over a one year period. So the first planet that was really confirmed to be a planet and discovered was 1995, Pegasi 51b. And it was through this radial velocity method. It was a sun-like star, okay? So there were a couple things that had been discovered orbiting other things, but this was the first sun-like star that had a exoplanet around it. It has a mass of about half of Jupiter's mass, which I think, if I remember correctly from what I read, that is how, that's why they chose the name Domitium. I think Domitium means half or something like that in Latin. And so half the mass of Jupiter seems odd to me, but that's the way it is. The one thing you'll notice there, though, the orbital period is four days. It takes this, Ju this Jupiter-sized object four days to go around the sun, which means the year for that planet is four of our days, right? That's pretty quick. 96 hours, OK, another year's gone by, right? Swings around pretty rapidly. So the orbital semi-major axis is 0.05 astronomical units. 1 20th the distance from Earth to the sun is how far away this thing is traveling around its star. The benefit of that is you get to see this happen lots and lots, right? So this radial velocity method where you're measuring uh, the blue shift and red shifted light, it's going by so quickly uh, over the course of four days that you get repeated measurements in a reasonable amount of time. Now, one of the problems that this caused was it was well outside the accepted theory of planetary formation. At the time, it wasn't even thought that you would get planets that were, um, that, that were as large as Jupiter or larger very often, but you certainly would only expect those out in the far reaches of the solar system, not up, up inside the orbit of where Mercury is in our solar system. There, it was subsequently confirmed using other techniques, and there have been hundreds of planets discovered using this technique since, since 1995. The second method is the transit method, also men mentioned in that video. And the idea here is that you have some planet passing in front of the sun. And we've known about transits of Venus for um, many, uh, many, many centuries. So Venus is passing over in front, and I just have an animation. You can imagine that shadow then okay, is blocking out some of the light. And if you watch for the intensity of the light, the intensity is going to drop as that planet passes in front of the sun. Here on Earth, we get about a 1% drop in the brightness of the sun uh, due to Venus, but we're pretty close to Venus when it does that. An Earth-sized tr transit, of an, of Earth transit of an exoplanet as viewed from Earth is it reduces the intensity by a factor of one, one part in 100,000. Okay? So imagine trying to detect that. You have a pair, uh, a headlight or a flashlight, right? Can you detect the dimming by one part in a hundred, much less one part in a thousand? A few other complications. One is that the typical transit time is on the order of a few hours, so you have to be looking at just the right time. You have to be looking before, during, and after that transit. And, uh, but about 80% of all exoplanets have been discovered using this method, 
and mo all, almost all of these have been discovered by the Kepler Space Telescope, okay, which was simultaneously monitoring um, 150,000 stars or something, looking at Dr. Estalis back there for confirmation. So there's some com complications. One is the geometric requirements. It has to be an edge-on view. So if you just imagine you take all these solar systems and you throw them out into the galaxy randomly, um, only about a half a percent of them are going to have the right orientation for us to see them uh, in this fashion. The rest of them are going to be face on or partially or whatever. They certainly won't have it be perfectly across the face for us. A couple of other issues though when they were first doing these measurements, one would be um, eclipsing binaries. So you have many star systems are binary star systems and they can be very close to one another and they're rotating around one another like this. Well every time one of those stars passes behind the other, you're going to get a dimming because you're only seeing one star instead of two. So that's a complication. You also have the issue of sunspots. Um, so a star rotates just like a planet does. And we have all these sunspots which are relatively cooler and show up as dark, but you have lots of other solar activity as well. So as this thing rotates around on its axis here, um, those sunspots disappear for a while and they come back. And so you have to pay attention and make sure that you're really observing a planet as opposed to some other solar activity. Okay, so, oops, sorry. Get this, these two simulations going here. So, what I have here, um, you can get from one of the NASA websites here, it is a simulation demonstrating what the Kepler Space Telescope monitors and how they detect planets. And so I have it, uh, an example of planet Kepler 71b and Kepler 62c. 71b, okay, so this is the orbit of the planet about its sun. Earth is down in this direction. Here is another view, okay, this is the view you would see from Earth. So that's the transit view, it's the edge on view. This star, KOI217, is about the same size as our sun, so that's the reason I've ha I have it up here. And the planet that is passing in front of it is about the same size as Jupiter, a little bit larger, but roughly the same size. And so as this, pl as this uh, planet goes around the sun like this, and they slow down the simulation down here where we would view it, as it's passing in front, you see the light curve, so you see the intensity of the light. And as it passes in front here, the, you see a little bit of noise here, but it def definitely dips down and goes across. The percentage change in the intensity there is about 2%, 2.28%, and the time that it takes is almost three hours. So you have to be watching it before, during, and after, and you're only watching for a 3% change in light. On the other hand, 62C here, Kepler 62C, um, has a size that is similar to Earth. It's a little bit smaller in diameter than Earth. The sun is also a little bit smaller than, or sorry, the Kepler 62c, the star, is a little bit smaller than our sun. But this is what you see when you're measuring the intensity, okay? So remember, you're measuring the intensity, you're taking lots of measurements here, and there is some noise in that, right? So there's a little bit of jitter. I think you and I would be hard pressed to pull out this curve out of the noise that is coming over there. The change that you're looking at there is about 0.008% of the light or something of that nature. So you have to work really hard to be able to identify these smaller planets. The big planets are much easier to pick up. So the Kepler Space Telescope has uh, discovered more than 2,000 of these things. Um, it was launched in 2009 and it has a couple different phases to its mission. It wasn't necessarily designed to have a couple phases, but uh, they're making the most out of it, what they can. The simulation over on the right, okay, corresponds to the CCDs, okay, so the telescope makes use of 84 uh, charged couple devices, or essentially the same type of thing you have in your digital camera, not exactly, but somewhat similar. And it, can, and it just stares at one, one spot in the sky. And so as the brightness of those changes, okay, you can measure the brightness changing. Each of these is not a single cell, by the way, right? You're talking megapixels in each one of those. So you're constantly just monitoring this spot in the sky, and you're constantly measuring the brightness of each of those different channels that you have there. Turns out it's a really complicated problem, too, because you have to get all this data down to Earth, right? And that has to go through NASA's Deep Space Network. You're given a finite bandwidth, so they don't get to download all their data. They have to do a lot of uh, pre-processing up there to decide what's important. But let me get back to this piece. So this is a simulation by, that, uh, by a graduate student, Ethan Cruz, at the University of Washington. He's an astronomy graduate student. And what this is, corresponds to is a one-week pattern okay, of all of the transits the Kepler Space Telescope was observing over one week. Okay? So every time you see a dot here, that corresponds to a transit. That's not really what you would see here, but it gives you a visual representation. 
He has them color coded by size, so the large circles are Jupiter size, the really small ones are Mercury size, and then as well by temperature. And you'll notice that there are a lot of big red dots there, right? So a lot of big hot Jupiters. Hot Jupiters was the name given um, after discovering Pegasi 51b because it's so close to the sun, it really shouldn't be there. Um, so, but that's what they called it. What you uh, get from this is there are a lot of large red dots there. A lot of that has to do with the selection, right? So it's a selection bias. Those are easier to detect. The smaller planets are going to be harder to detect. Smaller planets further away, even harder than that. But over the course of this week, it, um, Kepler Space Telescope essentially, now that now we know, looking at the data, was observing 90 transits, 90 transits simultaneously throughout that entire time. So over the course of a week, there are 90 transits going on at any given time throughout the entire week, which is a lot. Here again, it goes back to the idea, hey, they were looking at 150,000 stars. If you go try and look at three stars, the chances are you're not going to see a transit because they probably don't have the right orientation. You have to look at so many stars to be able to do this simultaneously. Okay, so short period planets are easier to detect. This is a table describing the summary as of last week of the different exoplanets that have been discovered and the methods. So the top three methods are the methods that I've discussed today. You see 2,600 of them here are the transit method. Most of those are associated with Kepler, although there are many, several other experiments that have been successful at detecting many, even some ground-based transits. Uh, radial velocity at 602 and then imaging 43. These down here total up a total of 100 planets. That's not to say they're insignificant or they're not important, but in the large scheme of things in terms of percentage-wise, when you're discovering exoplanets, um, right now, this is working as the best tool that we have, to, at least in terms of numbers. Give you some sense of the physical characteristics of these. So uh, these are confirmed planets. This is the planet radius on a log scale. And if you're not familiar with log scales, bear with me for a moment. And it is in units of Jupiter radii. So the 1 would correspond to a Jupiter radius. 10 raised to the 0th power is 1. So that's why we have Jupiter-sized planets here. We have Earth-sized planets right there. And what you probably notice from this is that most of the planets that have been discovered are what you might call super-Earths, right? They're somewhere between the size of Earth and, some, and the size of Neptune for perspective in our solar system here. It is interesting, and really this is the most common, and not all of this is selection bias, and we have nothing like that in our solar system here, right? We have Earth and Venus are about the same, uh, but nothing that is really large. The smaller ones here is probably selection bias because they are difficult to detect. Um, Jupiter size, here again, these are Jupiter size and most of those are near the sun, right? The ones that are f far away, we haven't really been able to detect because it takes too long for them to go around, right? Maybe 50 years or something in some cases. The orbital period, okay, so related to that uh, particular topic. This is the orbital period in days, again, on a log scale. So this corresponds to one year. You see that most planets that have been discovered have a period much less than a year. That's in part because it's easier to look at something for a year than it is to look at it for 20 years. The distance, uh, so the orbital semi-major axis, the distance from the planet to its star, uh, here is where the Earth lies at 10 to the zeroth power. Um, most of them are well inside that. That's linked to the orbital period as well. And I threw this slide up just to give you some sense of how far away most of these are. Okay, we have detected some that are fairly close, but most of these planets are way out in here. This is in units of parsecs, and a parsec is close to three light years. So we're at about 300 light years here. Um, all these planets are um, not quite a factor of 10 larger than that, but a good distance. If you think about that for a moment, though, since it's the Kepler Space Telescope that has discovered most of these, and it is looking at one collection of stars, the, it, your sample is going to be biased by, ever, by however far away that collection of stars happens to be. Okay, so some recent and interesting, perhaps, discoveries. Um, and these are all from this year, yeah, ranging from January 2016 through August 2016. So in August, you may have heard in the news, um, Proxima Centauri b, uh, the closest star to Earth, which it's much smaller than Earth. Uh, they discovered an Earth-ish sized planet orbiting some pla somewhere around that. And one of the interesting things there, while the orbital period is only 11.2 days, it's a much smaller star than our Sun, and as a result it's also much cooler. So the fact that you have this 11-day year, right, and when I say 11 days I'm referring to Earth days, 
So 11 days for the year going around that particular star. It is much closer, but because the star is so much cooler, it's possible that it is still in the habitable zone, meaning the temperature is low enough that it could support life. It's also close enough that perhaps, maybe not in your lifetime or my lifetime, but in the lifetime of the human race, perhaps we could send, uh, send a space probe or send someone to a star system that far away. Hard to say, but that is, um, I wanted to go back here. Um, other ones, so HD 131399AB, this was a direct imaging of a large planet in orbit around a star which is one of a three star system. So in this case, you actually have a binary star system, um, a pair of binary, eclipsing binary stars over here. Then you have another star sitting over here and they're all gravitationally bound to one another and there's a large planet circling one of those stars, not the double star system out here. If you had talked about this probably 30 years ago, people would think you're crazy, right? I mean, the, the chances of having a store stable orbit like that are probably pretty small. Well, one thing about the universe is when you go out and look and see what's out there, you don't get to say what should be out there, you get to see what is out there. That happens to be one of the things out there. TRAPPIST-1, uh, these were three rocky Earth-sized planets. Um, the initial discussions, they even talked about perhaps all three of them would be in the habitable zone. Two of them are probably not, but there's one that probably is in the habitable zone. It's only 40 light years away from Earth. It is going to receive fairly careful scrutiny in the upcoming year from the Kepler, uh, Kepler's second mission, the K2 portion of its mission. So hopefully they will be, get to be able to get better measurements of those planets, um, give us a better idea of how they might, may or may not host life. These two down here, so the twin stars HD 133131A and B, one, host, one of these hosts uh, um, two Jupiter-sized planets while the other one hosts one. They're only separated, so they're, these two stars are separated by about 360 astronomical units, which, okay, it seems big, it's hard for us to comprehend. Um, that's only about 48 uh, light hours. So it takes light from one sun to get, to get to the other one. It's only about two days. Our nearest stars are about three to four light years away. Right? So these stars are fairly close to one another, and they both have, star have planets orbiting them. So this is one of the first discoveries where we've been able to identify that type of system. At the very least, seems to be interesting. Um, there are some other interesting, and for lack of a better term, called oddballs. So Kepler-47 uh, hosts two planets, both, um, and they both orbit a binary star. So this simulation up here is showing what that would look like, the binary star but then you have two planets orbiting about that. I think it was back in Star Trek or some or Star Wars, right? Was it Tatooine or something like that? Two suns. So uh, this is that type of system there. You have one smaller sun, uh, one smaller star orbiting the other, but nevertheless, this type of system. Uh, this particular star, WASP-79b, so WASP is an experiment or an observatory, 79b, this is a planet that actually orbits the poles. So most of the stuff in our solar system orbits um, all in the same plane, roughly, and it's all in the same direction, and the sun is spinning in the same direction, and most of the planets are spinning in that direction and so forth. Well, this planet happens to be orbiting over the top of its sun like this, right? And it's not real uh, obvious why we would end up with a planet that is doing that, but here again, you look out in the universe, and it really seems the more we study these things, that unless something is expressly forbidden by the laws of physics, it seems like there's planets out there that are actually behaving in that manner. Um, Hat P72 and 17b, um, these two, and these are different stars, uh, similarly named, they have retrograde orbits, meaning, okay, if the sun is spinning in this direction and most of the planets are spinning this way, hey, there's a planet going in the opposite direction around its sun than the others, which would be kind of weird and odd. Kepler-36, uh, these are two planets that are really close together and hard to imagine how you would end up there as well. They have orbital periods of 14 and 16 days, right? So going around their star like this, one of them's doing 14 days, one of them takes 16 days, really close in, in space. Compare that to our solar system, you know, where, okay, the Earth is one year and Mars is, uh, what, one and a half years or something of that nature, Jupiter's five years and so forth, 14 and 16 days. And this then brings to the last category of these interesting oddballs, perhaps called, oftentimes called rogue planets. Um, these are ones that are not, these are objects that are not associated with a star, which then if we go back to my earlier definition, they're really not planets either, right? So an exoplanet would be something that is associated with some star. 
These are objects that are planet-sized things out in the universe, and they just cruise along because um, Newton's laws of motion say, hey, if you don't have anything tugging on you, you're just going to keep moving in that straight direction. You don't get to slow down or anything. Um, lots of different names there, lots of other labels. They're most of the time detected using gravitational lensing. Um, they can be from direct imaging as well. The problem with direct imaging is there's no nearby star to shine a lot of light on it so that you see. And this is a planet, by definition, it doesn't really have its own luminosity associated with it. Now, it doesn't mean it doesn't give off any energy. All objects will give off some energy, but it's going to be very dim. So gravitational lensing uh, is a complicated, um, a c complicated mechanism by which you can study these things. One of the serious problems with this technique, though, is it only happens once. So basically, the idea is, as the planet pa passes in front of something, um, a star or whatever else, the star actually brightens momentarily because you're getting, using gravity to form this lens, which then causes the star to brighten. Well, this planet that is not associated with a star passes in front of a star, and you see this brightening, and so you detected this planet. When's the next time you're going to get to see that again? Never, right? So it's a one-time thing. And you can demonstrate that you are capable of doing this, but you're not really going to get a lot of good information about that planet through that technique. So future work in this area, um, a lot of folks are concentrating on habitability and as a result of that life. So if we think of life here on Earth, we require water. This is a graph of radius of the planet, of the exoplanet, and the estimated planetary equilibrium temperature in Kelvin. So um, up in this range here, Kelvin and Celsius, while they're not the same, they're very close to one another. Down here at zero, not so much. But if you think of liquid water, we sort of need temperatures between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius, something of that range. It varies a little bit with pressure and so forth. But if you zoomed in on this range and said, well, we would like a rocky type planet because it's going to hard, be hard for us to imagine a planet like Jupiter supporting life where there is no surface. So if you want a rocky type planet, OK, maybe they need to be Earth or super Earth size. And then if you zoom in on the temperature, you get this inset here with all these green dots, which correspond to confirmed planets. And then if you further restrict it and say, well, what about those that have a nice temperature range and a rocky surface, you'd be looking at that. And hopefully you can see that while this is not nearly as many planets as we have here, there's a lot of planets there, right? And we are still not very good at detecting those smallish type planets. So the prospects of those are probably pretty good. You also have to have sufficient gravitational attraction to retain an atmosphere, we would think, although you never know what life is going to throw at you, so I wouldn't be too uh, cocky with that particular statement. Conditions for liquid water can depend upon the composition of the atmosphere. So if you have lots of greenhouse gases, for example, that's going to change how your, your equilibrium temperature is going to be. Um, there are other factors in there as well. For our understanding of life, you probably have to have limited radiation. So the sun puts off a lot of radiation. Uh, you can get around that in a variety of ways, one of which is a magnetic field like Earth. So we have lots of radiation streaming toward us from the sun, but our magnetic field protects us from most of that. Um, not so with many other planets. So if you are looking for a habitable planet, you would probably want a magnetic field. You can mitigate it some by the distance to the star, but then you start getting cold. So it's a trade-off. And there are lots of folks talking about trying to study the atmosphere for bio, what they call biosignature gases. And these are gases that you would associate with life. So one of the big ones that they look for is um, the oxygen molecule. Tend to associate that with life, um, partly due to the fact that if it's in the atmosphere and there is no life, there are other reactions that happen that essentially remove that from the atmosphere. You might think, and so plants here, right, they take up carbon dioxide and they emit, the, emit oxygen. And then we breathe that in and we reproduce the, the CO2. You might think of CO2, hey, there's a good biosignature gas. But there are lots of other processes associated with Earth science that produce that gas in particular. So CO2 is probably not a very good biosignature gas. OK, I couldn't resist putting in one more of the, these you know, great visualizations. So this is Ethan Cruz again, this graduate student in uh, University of Washington, who I don't know, by the way. So I'm giving him lots of plugs, but I don't know him. He just does really good work. Uh, this is from, I think, 2014, a, a um, graphic that he produced. These were all of the solar systems, uh, besides our, well, including our own, that had been discover discovered by Kepler up to that time in 2014. And he has set them to scale in the sense that, OK, the ones that are moving around really fast, here's our solar system here with the four inner planets. And you see how slowly our planets are moving around. 
These planets are moving around much quicker. That's part because they're easier to detect. They also have lots bigger planets than most of our planets here because they're easier to detect. Here is the orbit of Jupiter. Here is Saturn for a sense of scale. And so you see all these planets. They're not sitting in our solar system, obviously, but we're just trying, he's trying to show you what the sense of scale of all the ones that have been discovered look like. So questions for uh, this talk. Why would you look for exoplanets? And maybe it's just like mountains because they're there, right? Something's out in the universe. Someone's going to go look at it. It may not have a practical application, but someone's going to find it interesting. You might wonder whether our solar system is unique. Any thoughts? Nope, it's not unique, certainly. Uh, there are uh, many other structures. You might wonder whether we're typical. The answer to that is probably not, but you would probably have to define what typical means, right? So if you look at what we've discovered so far, most of what we've discovered so far is n looks nothing like our solar system. Well, OK, you have a star and you have some planets, but that's about where it ends. The sizes of the planets and so forth uh, vary significantly compared to what we are experiencing here. You might ask, are we alone? And you're happy that I have the answer, right? Are we alone? Well, there's no conclusive evidence yet. Okay, I won't say that there's any conclusive evidence one way or the other. But part of that reason for asking that question, are we alone? Okay, we might want to learn. Are there other, if life is not unique, are there other intelligent li lives? Even if we can't travel between them, and maybe we can learn about the other system, much like we have uh, our solar or our galaxy, as well as the universe in general. So. To finish out here, I have one slide here. I'm going to encourage you to go exploring. There are lots of different ways that um, you can explore exoplanets on your own and learn about them however you would like. And I've sort of listed a few references here in probably uh, increasing complexity as you go along. So this is the uh, Kepler spacecraft web, web presence. And they have a wide variety of materials there. So this is entertaining everyone from um, kindergarten, first, second, and third grade on through the secondary education system into, into college and so forth. They have something there for you. So they have some education stuff. They have a discussion of just how you might go about finding these. But they also have a fair amount of stuff for scientists who are interested in digging deeper. Um, you can download the data from Kepler Space Telescope, and you can go searching for your own planets. Okay? The data is freely available to you. You don't have to sign up to be a special person or anything. The European Space Organization, they're very involved in several, uh, several different observatories and experiments to try and detect uh, planets, and they have a good web presence here. Uh, as you want to get more complicated, so this is also um, associated with NASA. It's the NASA Exoplanet Archive, and there is every bit of data related to exoplanets that you could ever hope to have there. It can be uh, a bit daunting to try and dig in. As I said, you end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole, and sometimes you want to come up for air. The last one I have here is you can be a planet hunter. So this group, planethunters.org, um, you can go sign up with these folks, and they will train you. They'll say, OK, this is how you will go about finding planets. And once you're trained and ready to do that, they will start sending you data to examine and learn how to uh, d identify possible planets. And they've actually discovered some exoplanets through this particular system. So. I would encourage you to do that. And with that, if you want some references, there you go. So thank you for coming. We have about three minutes for questions, if anyone has one. And I'll be happy to direct them to Dr. Stallis in the back. Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, so, ro so the question is uh, sort of about rogue, rogue planets. Are they so far away from everything else that there's nothing pulling on them gravitationally and so forth? And so the answer is two part. We don't really know how they got there. But the speculation would be that they were probably ejected from, from standard or more typical solar systems. So when you get lots of large planets, so some of the examples I said there, we had a system where they had three planets. One was 10 times the size of Jupiter, another one was about 10, and one was 7. You have these really large objects. Well, as a smaller object comes close to one of those, the gravitational influence can take over, and it may end up ejecting it from the, from the solar system that it is in. And then it just goes sailing across the universe, sort of like our Voyager spacecraft are. Anyone else? Yeah. It's probably thought that that's due to a series of collisions then? 
more, more than likely, it has to be associated with collision. So we have conservation of angular momentum, which tends to squash things into a disk and keeps everything rotating in the same direction, more or less. Um, so probably a series of collisions. And even in our solar system, I mean, we have, do have some rather funky objects. Um, Uranus, for example, okay, is tilted on its axis, while Earth is tilted at 20 degrees. Uranus is almost 90, right, Dr. Stollis? So as it goes around, right, its pole points toward or away from the sun. Okay, it moves around like this. So if this is the sun, and it was probably a collision base there as well. Um, Venus is an oddball in terms of its speed of rotation, and uh, so it's probably a collision would be probably what happened. Yeah. Yeah, no, so the question being for, we had probably another 10 methods of, of discovering exoplanets and so forth, and was it the same data set? And really the answer to that is no. Uh, they're typically just different experiments. So completely looking at something, uh, something different and saying, hey, let's go uh, study this particular star over here and see what we find. Um, so like direct imaging, for example, the first one that I started off with, direct imaging in the optical wavelengths, um, you're probably going to be pretty hard pressed to find anything, right? So, as I said, this star has been fairly well studied since the 1940s. And so they had a lot of information about the star, and they said, hey, I wonder if there's a planet there. Let's get the Hubble Space Telescope and then go examine it. So, yeah, all, the, all of those other techniques are um, other experiments and probably multiple experiments in, within each category. Anyone else? All right. Thank you. Pizza on your way out. <laughs>